Our reading this morning comes from Psalm 29. We'll begin at 1 and, and go through uh, 9. <clears throat> Psalm 29, 1 through 9. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everything says glory. Good morning, everybody. We are going to be in the Old Testament today. And the teens, for you guys, it's kind of a, uh, a remember lesson. Our teens have been studying the book of Daniel. And so I know that a lot of them are going to know a lot of the stuff that we're about to talk about. Um, we are glad you're here today. If you are new to us or if you're visiting, uh, maybe you're here with someone for the first time or, or you've been kind of trying us out, uh, thank those that are online. Guys, we've got a good online presence. Um, we're glad you are here. Today's are a little different. Uh, we're our fifth Sundays. Uh, we are going to say afterwards today and eat. And then today we're going to have a little trunk or treat and do some of those things. So we hope you'll be a part of that. If you're visiting and you didn't know that was going on, please stay. We, we have plenty of food um, and uh, just come and eat and get to know some of us. Let us get to know you. And um, we're excited for the day that the Lord has provided. We're going to talk about that Lord that causes things to shake that we read in Psalms. And I'm going to take two chapters in Daniel, chapter 5 and chapter 6, and, and we're going to compare them against each other. And in one of those chapters, there is fear. And in the other chapter, right after it, there is fearlessness. And so we're going to look at those two things that God put chapters back to back. He juxtaposed them so that we could see this story. This is our time to study the scripture. Our kids have gone down to prepare for their lessons and the things that they do there. I hope adults, you take this time just as serious. Open your Bibles. It's going to be very textual today. We're going to be in Daniel 5 and Daniel 6, and we're going to be looking at the text and um, seeing what it is God has for us there. We're going to talk today in Daniel chapter 5 about the city of Babylon. And guys, the city of Babylon gets used a lot in the scripture as kind of the city that you don't want to be in. It, everything is wrong in that city. Many of you may remember several years ago a commercial about um, picante sauce, right? And this guy's picante sauce was made in New York City. Anybody remember that? And people were like, you can't make like a Southwest dish in New York City. Well, maybe we kind of make New York City or Los Angeles, some of those uh, places where things, you know, just aren't like they are right here. Well, that is what is Babylon is going to become. Babylon becomes kind of a byword for where you don't want to be, who you don't want to be. Um, but it kind of starts here in chapter 5. And we're going to look at the fall of Babylon in that. So just to kind of tell you, when we're talking cities, I think sometimes we think in the ancient world small. I just want you to picture the great city of Babylon for a moment, all right? You've got to realize it's 14 miles long on each side. Yes, each side, 14 miles long. I don't know if any of you got up and went running this morning. God bless you. Um, but, but I don't know if you ran 14 miles. But if you did, that's one side of the city of Babylon. 
Inside of it is about 56 square mile or miles uh, around there, square miles. It's got walls that are 108 feet thick and about 412, 17 feet high. I'm going to be able to read here in just a moment. Some 100 gates to get in it. Three and four story homes. Again, this is not like maybe sometime we picture the ancient world. But guys, the ancient world is quite advanced, especially in those parts of the world today. On both sides of the Euphrates, it crosses a river. Some of you have been downtown Nashville, right? Nashville spans the river. One side is uh, a row of, of old warehouses. The other side is the Titan Stadium, and we have bridges going across. It would have been the same thing. It's not uncommon that cities often spanned rivers. They were great transportation. They were great water systems that they would use. And so we're going to see that they even built a moat. They divert the river around the city. And so I want you to kind of picture this very large modern city when we're talking about Babylon, right? It's not a wide place in the road. It's not something that probably we have lived in today. Maybe you have visited a medieval city in Europe or somewhere like this. But this is a place where people were and they are. And so maybe as we get into it, we look here uh, at this great city. Let, let's join me, if you will, uh, in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, excuse me, Belshazzar, the king made a great feast. I picked this because today I hope we're going to stay and have a great feast. I don't expect what happens in this story to happen in our feast, but if it does, it will be memorable. We have some times coming up where we're going to have feasts. Some of you are looking forward to getting together, maybe with family, something you haven't been able to do maybe the last few years. And that may be because of, of sickness or just because of other things that have been going on. And so they're going to have a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drink wine in the presence of the thousands. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem. So they're living it up at this party. They, they're celebrating who they are, which is kind of interesting when we see the end of the story in a few moments. And they're living it up so much, he says, you know what would be really neat? It'd be really neat if we brought the vessels that, that my father captured and brought here from the temple. Now I want you to think about that. Today we're going to have some soup and we're going to have some sandwiches, but most of you don't expect me to probably serve it in these, these things down here on this table. Not that they're holy, not that they're, they're special, but, but we kind of think of those as they have a purpose, they have a service. And so they go and they take these vessels which have been used for worship and they're going to make them for partying. And he's doing it as a way of saying, ha ha, look at us, look at all that we have accomplished and so he brings those vessels in so they might drink of them. And it's not just that. Then they brought the gold vessels which had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Guys, they are using these vessels of honor for dishonor. These vessels of honor for dishonor. I'm hoping to wrap that back into a message near the end of this lesson. So I hope you'll kind of file that away. So they are living it up. A couple of things about this passage we probably ought to point out. First of all, in that time period, they don't have a word for grandfather. You know, I find it interesting today that many of you are becoming uh, grandfathers and grandmothers at a younger age maybe than you think of grandmothers and grandfathers. And you guys give yourself all kinds of names that I've got to remember now like Pop and Lolly. That's an interesting one that I've seen thrown around uh, here. Uh, you know, Pa and, and, and something, uh, initials, uh, you know, all the GGs, you know. I, I don't know why we don't want to honor Grandma and Granddad, but I get that. I get that. Um, today I saw some of you visiting with your grandchildren, right? They don't have a word for grandfather in their language. They only have a word for father. Nebuchadnezzar is not Belshazzar's direct father. It's his grandfather. But now we use this language all the time. We say things like, George Washington is the father of our country. Yet none of you are related to George Washington. Or we sing a song at VBS, Father Abraham had many sons. I would make you do that today, but we would need oxygen at the end of that song, right? Those of you who are familiar with that one. Yeah, if Abraham's not our father. 
but, but we sing that. So when it says father here, it's really his grandfather. These things have been in storage. Now remember, God had worked with Nebuchadnezzar to teach him some lessons about how great God was. But by the time it got to the next generation, they really weren't that knowledgeable of how great God was. As a matter of fact, they thought their gods were greater. And so that's where we see it in this city of Babylon. So that's where they're having their festival. This large city, everyone's there. Everyone now has realized that they have just basically said, look how good we are. We captured this stuff. Look how we're using it. Where is this God? And guys, as they are having that, something unique happens. Join me in Daniel 5, verse 5. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. While they think they are celebrating how big and how great they are, God is about to let them know, no, actually, I am greater, and I am bigger. I don't know if any of you have children who have decided to become Shakespeare in your house on the wall. Is that possible? Is it possible that some of you could take me to your house today and, and there are some places on the wall where there's some new art that wasn't there a few days ago? And maybe you've had time to clean that off and maybe you haven't had time to clean that off. I'm reminded because my mom's in the audience today of a story we often tell in my family where one time I was in my room and I don't know how old I was, you can ask her, but um, I had taken a, a pen or a pencil and I had drawn on my pillowcase a person. And my mother asked, why did you draw a person? And I think I said, because I was lonely, right? I'm sure I might have been sent to my room, <coughs> right? I don't know if that's the story or not. You ought to ask her. Well, she washed that pillowcase, and I, I'm told that I asked, did it break the washing machine? And she said, what? I said, did it break the washing machine when that man went in there, right? I mean, that's kind of a kid's idea. Maybe some of you have thought about writing. You know, we kind of have writing on the wall today, and it doesn't throw us off. But that was not a common thing to be sitting in a banquet and see the fingers of a man's hand writing on the wall. If it happened in here, it would have our attention. It has his attention. Can I read between the lines here and show you some things in the text you may not have noticed before? It says the joints of his hips were loosened. It's very possibly that is an idiom, and since we are adults in the room, that he soiled himself. Are you with me? That, that, that's how scary and how it caught him off guard. It does talk about his knees knocking together, right? I, I mean, so this really changed the whole tone of what had been going on. And then we read on in Daniel chapter 7. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple, that's a royal color, have a chain of gold, that's payment, around his neck, and shall be third in the ruler of the kingdom, that's a promotion. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed and his lords were astonished. Guys, it's kind of like Debbie Downer, right? I mean, there had been a party going on and then something happened and kind of goes, right? And they say, we, we can't interpret that. We, we don't know what it means. And it stopped everything. And it so upset the king that he's willing to pay for anyone to tell him, what do those words say? In Daniel chapter 5, verse 10, it says the queen. It's very possibly this is not his wife. If you read earlier, it says at the banquet were the wives. It's very possible this is the queen mother. This is his mother. She still must be alive. And so she has heard something has happened to her son, uh, that, that things have not gone well uh, for the feast. And so she comes to the feast. And that's a rare thing. Many of you may know the story of Esther. You, you didn't just come see the king, but I guess a mom can kind of get away with those things, right? It says, the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. Mom's trying to pep him up, right? Says, hey, hey, don't worry about this. But she knows something he doesn't. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. 
Now that's interesting because that's not who they were worshiping. That's not who they had been celebrating. And in the days of your father, again, most likely grandfather, light and understanding and wisdom. Guys, do you see what Daniel is described as here? Light, understanding, wisdom. Are those how the people of God are described? Is that how you would describe yourself when it comes to being a follower of God? Those are almost messianic words. Think about the things we often talk about Jesus. And wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, again, your grandfather, the father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. She says, honey, son, kid, don't worry, you've forgotten. There's someone in here who can read this. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledgeable, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now that's always confusing. This is Belshazzar the king. Daniel's given name in Babylon is Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. So mom shows up and says, hey son, don't worry. You, you actually can answer this even if they can't. Maybe you've forgotten there's somebody. And so that becomes the story. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. Now I've often pictured what this must have looked like. I want you to picture what it looks like. You are Daniel who had been captive many years ago. As a matter of fact, some people believe between Daniel chapter 4 and Daniel chapter 5. Are you with me church? There's a 30 year gap. You've been gone from Jerusalem a long time and you walk into a banquet hall and there sitting on the tables are vessels that you know don't belong there. They belong in service to the Lord God and they have been using them for folly. Then Daniel was brought in before the king and the king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah? Guys, that had happened years ago, decades ago whom your father the king brought from Judah, I have heard of you that the spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom, do you see how he now describes Daniel, are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and made known to me its interpretation, but they could not give me the interpretation of the thing. Now Daniel's just been called in. He wasn't at the party. He, he's not a part of that. But he's brought in and he now sees handwriting on the wall. And the king says, hey, no one else can understand what that is. Any of you ever been handed a note by somebody else that you couldn't read? Any of you like myself have such bad handwriting you write notes to yourself that you cannot read? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Many of you, if you receive something from me, generally it will be typed. Why? So you can read it. And so it says here, and I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. This is a puzzle. We, we don't know what it is. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Whew, pressure, right? Pressure. But Daniel isn't interested in any of those things. Daniel understands he is about to have to share a lesson with a grandson that he thought he had shared with the grandfather that should have been passed down. Then Daniel answered and said to the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give rewards to another. I want you to see Daniel's thing there. Hey, don't reward me. This isn't about me. I've got a gift and I want to share it. Guys, do you have a gift? Has God given you a gift and are you willing to share it? Do you want to share that thing that God has uniquely given you? And give your reward to another, yet I will read the writing of the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your again grandfather, a kingdom and a majesty and a glory and an honor. You know what he had forgotten? You know what Belshazzar had forgotten? All that he had was because his grandfather had acknowledged the Lord most high. Guys, what is it you have that you've forgotten to thank God for? I appreciate Mark's prayer this morning. It may have caught some of you off guard to pray for things like eggs and bacon and electricity and sewer systems. 
But guys, those are things we have, and are we thankful for them? I love, and, and if you want to be a part of our youth program, our children's program, before they come to the auditorium, sometimes the reason they're a few minutes late is they're praying for things. And yes, yeah, sometimes they pray for things we as adults don't think are worthy of praying for. They're thankful for those things. Now, Mark, the only thing I got to say about your prayer this morning is Hardy's drive through Where was that prayer, right? <laughs> I mean, that's my breakfast this morning. I'm not allowed to turn the lights on in my house that early, okay? I don't know what it's like at your house. But, but, but yeah, I'm thankful every morning. You know, on Sunday mornings I pull in and, and, and somebody's there. And am I thankful for that? Are you thankful for who's with you this morning? Are you thankful for who's in this room, whether you know them or not? Whether you know what their gift is or not? Whether you know what their struggle is or not? He says, everything you held, Belshazzar, is because of God's relationship with your grandfather. But you have lost that relationship. Can I say to a room of adult Christians, do you have the relationship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit because of your relationship with them? Or are you still trying to ride in on the coattails of somebody else? He says, I, I don't need your gift O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and a majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, all peoples, nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. Your grandfather was great. And he was great because he had acknowledged God. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed. Daniel has to remind Belshazzar that Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten God at some point during this story. That Nebuchadnezzar had thought he was important and God had had to basically make him go mad. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar crawled around on all fours. That's not a very kingly posture. That he ate of the grass of the field. That he looked like a beast out in the field. And God had to humble him. And so he reminds Belshazzar of that story that probably was his family story. As I've shared one with you today. But you, O son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron, wood and stone which do not see or know and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hands were sent from him and the writing was written. Guys, I don't know that we often get to talk to kings like that. I don't know that many people in that room had ever got to talk to a king like that. And who is this man who decades ago had been taken as a young boy from, from a captive province, brought into town, made important over time because the way that he served is God and it was recognized by these people and now he gets to basically dress down the king. And he says, King, the reason those words are there is because of you. And let me tell you what they say. And so Daniel begins to interpret those words. But I want you to see some things that were wrong with Belshazzar. If you're in here with us today, there's a handout on the pew. And there are six things I want you to look at on that handout for just a moment as we begin to transition to chapter 6. These are the sins of Belshazzar. These are the things that Daniel says, Belshazzar, this is why you are no longer able to be blessed by God. Now, I know some of you say, well, I don't worship idols. Be careful. That's not the only thing he talks about here. He says, number one, you didn't humble yourself in his heart. Are you humble? Have you come before God with humbleness today? Are you ready to gather at this table with humbleness, knowing there's nothing you can do? It is the blood of Christ that forgives you of sin. doesn't mean there's not a response to it. It doesn't mean there's a way of life because of it. But it's that blood that cleanses you. Did not profit with the dealings of God and his grandfather. Guys, are, are, are you thankful for what you have? I said last week, we're moving into a season of want. We're moving into a season of want. December is that month where we often think of all the things that we want. 
Are we happy with what we have? Why would God give us more when we're not happy with what we have now? He exalted himself above God. Guys, did we ever say this? Look at what I have made. Look at my life. Look at all the things I have done. Very guilty of that, I think, in a culture that we live in. When's the last time you realized we would be nothing except for God? He desecrated the sanctified vessels. And you say, well, hold on. I, you know, I, I've never been to Jerusalem. I don't have any. No, you know, we are a vessel of God. It talks in the scripture how we are the clay pots that God puts his spirit into. It talks about how, how we are the temple and we are to be with honor. How, how is your vessel this morning? How is your, have you come today full of, of faith and of love and of hope? When you saw the fruits of the spirit, did you check those off or did you just think that was a cute kid's song? And they praised idol gods. You ever praise idol gods? You, you ever give credit to something more in the news than what's in the God that's in the know? And he refused to glorify the true God who gives life to all. Now you're here this morning. I'm going to be honest with you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And we mean that. But did you come to glorify this morning? Did you sing songs about faith and mean it? Did you sing songs about the hand of God? I love that Stephen had a song in there today that talked about God and hand because that was the lesson today. Did, did you come ready to worship and if necessary to serve today in one of the activities? See, those are the sins of Belshazzar. And I think those are things we have to think about in our world. Well, here's the handwriting on the wall, right? And, and it doesn't mean anything to you because I don't read this language, you don't read this language, and neither did the people around except for Daniel. And Daniel says, this is the inscription, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin. Some of you may remember this from an earlier kid's story that you had younger in your life. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. How would you like to know the day you were going to die? Well, what if I told you today I'm going to pass out letters and when you open it is going to be a date and that is your last day on earth? How would you receive that? Some of you would be like, whew, I'm going to be around a while. And other people would be like, oh, they're going to be around a while, <laughs> right? Some of you might open and go, oh, no, no, I'm going to live a lot longer than that. You're going to argue with God about it, aren't you? Some of you are going to be surprised at how long you might be here. And some of you might be surprised that it's not as long as you thought. Guys, the king of this kingdom of that grand city is told, you're done. You're done, Mene, you're done. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. God has looked at you in your life and you're not living up. Guys, how about you? When God looks at your life, are you living up? Are you living up to, to those words that you've come to hear today and those words you've come to sing today and, 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 and a kingdom of people that you've come to praise with today? He says, Perez, are you farson? Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Any of you ever been to an estate sale? Been to an estate sale? Six of you. The rest of you should go. <laughs> And someday they'll have one of your stuff. Someday whatever it is you collect, someday whatever it is you treasured is going to be put out on borrowed tables in the front yard of your house and people are going to come by and they're going to pay a quarter for even though it says it's a dollar. <laughs> We've all been to them. Guys, do you realize all the things we have one day are going to be somebody else's? And, and we, again, I'm not saying you can't collect things. I'm not saying you can't have things. But, but they can't be who you are. are you, did you hear me, church? They can't be who you are. Because one day those things will be divided among people. And that's what he says to the king. You have made your life about being king of the Babylonians. And today it's over. And sure enough, you know what happens? He was weighed in the balances. He was weighed on scales. That's how we would do it today. In those days, scales weren't just this thing that you avoided in your bathroom, right? Scales were things that were often in the marketplace that you put weights on one side and goods on the other and you made sure you got the right amount of goods. 
Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Wow. He gave that kind of news to a king, and he got a promotion. Truth to power. Truth to power. And it got him ahead, not behind. But then the next verse is very interesting to me. The next verse, after Daniel gets a promotion, says this. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. You know what history tells us? History tells us on October 12th, 539 B.C., that the Persians came in and upstream of that river, the Euphrates River that ran through that town, they diverted it into a canal which lowered the river. And because the river was lowered, the army of the Medes and the Persians were able to walk into that great city with the water being at about this height. Which means this city that had these huge walls, 400 something feet tall, 100 something feet thick, it was the lowering of the water that got them because they never knew. Here's the thing I want you to realize. This was a city that was primed for attack and they're partying. That, I don't know that I'd ever put that together before until this lesson. Here is a group of people who are partying while a major army is on its way to attack them. Did they think so much of themselves that they thought they can't get us? Guys, when you leave today, and it leads us to the second part of our lesson, it says the devil goes around like a roaring what? Lion. He's waiting outside. the Because in here it's hard to attack. Maybe not. But that's another story. But out there, when he gets you separated, he's ready to attack. And that's exactly what happens to that city. That night they diverted the river and the army just marched right in downtown. Took the palace took the courtyards, took the marketplaces, and within one night, a major city fell. Meeny, meeny, tickle you farson. Those were the words on that wall. And that was not just a prophecy, it was a promise that came true that night. I want to very quickly look at Daniel chapter 6. Let's look quickly at Daniel chapter 6. I think it's the story that you may know better, okay? It may be the story that you know better. You can find this story <clears throat> about the invasion on a stela of Cyrus. It's in the British Museum. Uh, you can go and see it. This is not just a biblical account. There, there, there's extra historical literature uh, about that capture if you want to do some historical evidence of that. But I want to go to Daniel chapter 6 because what I want to parallel this with or maybe juxtapose it with is a man who was fearful because of his relationship with God was not where it needed to be. And I want to compare that to a man because his relationship was where it needed to be with God. He was fearless. He was fearless. I'm not going to look at every part of this passage today. They're going to be up here. They're in your Bible. I want to look at some highlights, maybe just to show you some things that maybe you had forgotten were in the story, to remind our teens of things they've already studied. You know, we're going to talk about this story. We often call it Daniel in the lion's den. But guys, it happens right after pretty much he had just gotten promotion under one king who dies. Can you imagine getting a promotion and the paperwork doesn't go through and, and, and the person who gave it to you dies and there's no proof of it? Well, that's kind of the situation here. Although Daniel's countenance and Daniel's ability to help is going to show up in the next kingdom. This is what I love about Daniel. Because God is with him, he has lived for decades in a foreign land, kept his faith, becomes fearless, and is noticed. He doesn't want to blend in with the Babylonians. He wants to be known as a follower of holy God. Join me real quickly as we look at this. Darius is going to come in. Darius is going to come in and set up his kingdom now. He has overtaken the Babylonian kingdom. And in doing so, he's going to set up a government system. I'm not going to get caught up in all the details today, but I'm just going to let you look at it real quickly. Basically, he sets up some provinces, just like we have counties. He sets up some states uh, and some areas, and he puts people in charge of those. And one of those that eventually catches his eye is a guy named Daniel. Daniel survived several different political incarnations of Babylon. 
And so Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because of an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Those of you who are with us on our Wednesday night study, we've been studying Joseph. And we've been seeing how the Lord has been with Joseph all throughout that journey from the moment of the pit to the moment of the pinnacle. And Daniel's that guy because God is with him. And guys, his story starts as a captive from Judea. And he finds himself one of the most powerful men in a foreign nation. Now that didn't make everybody happy. That didn't make everybody happy. We've all been in the work world. We've all been in places where someone got a promotion that maybe we thought we deserved. Or maybe they brought in somebody from outside the company to run it when you thought it ought to be somebody from within the company. Well, that's kind of what happens here. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault. Immediately they start saying, how can we get this Daniel guy? How can we get him? Well, what can we do to bring him down? And so they start watching him. Guys, is anybody watching you? Is anybody at work watching you? Are your children watching you? Are your neighbors watching you? Are they seeing a Christian? That's what maybe you've claimed to be or they think you may be. And they're trying to see, are you different? And so they're looking at Daniel. And they're trying to say, how is he different? We're going to find a charge against him. We shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. He wasn't breaking any government rules. And so what are we going to do? Well, let, let's attack his religion. Let's find something he's doing there, uh, and maybe that's against our religion. And so they go to the king, and I think you know the rest of this story. But Daniel finds himself a person of integrity. Why? Because he was faithful in work. He was faithful in work, and he was personal purity. I hope those are two things you look for in your walk with God. Let's see how Daniel closes out this story. So the plot is against Daniel. The plot is to find a way that they can destroy Daniel. And so what do they do? Well, they go around and they watch him. And eventually they go to the king and they say, King, you know what you ought to do? You ought to make a law. And the king's thinking, well, that's what kings do. Kings make laws, right? And so you ought to make a law that, that no one should worship anything but you for 30 days. This is why they knew they had Daniel. Because they had watched him enough to know that he worshiped Almighty God. Guys, if people watched you for a time period, would they know you believe in Almighty God? Would, would they know that you believe in Holy God? Would they know about Jesus Christ when we use the word Christian, it means Christ-like. What are they learning about Jesus through you? And so that's what they had learned is that Daniel was a good man and that Daniel had a good God. And there was no way they could bring him down unless they twisted the law against him. And that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to go to the king and they're going to say, hey, write this out. And here's the thing you got to realize. Once a king writes something out, once a king says something, it is, becomes law. You think your parents had it made when they said, because I said so? Anybody ever been there? When he said, because I said so, it was so. And so what happens is he passes this law. And as soon as they can, they go out and they try to find Daniel. And they know that he prays three times a day. Guys, I don't know what your prayer life is like. Some days mine's better than others. Can, I, can we just be honest? Some days I get busy in prayer. Sometimes instead of moving to the front of the line on a busy day, gets moved to the back of the line on a busy day. And that's probably something I need to think about more often. Sometimes I tend to panic instead of pray. But Daniel for three uh, times a day goes out and prays. And so they finally go out and they find him publicly and they arrest him. And they say, hey, king, didn't you sign something saying that if someone didn't pray to you or worship you or, or think about you all the 30 days? And the king says, yes, I said, they, they said, aha, we found somebody. And it's Daniel. Now, remember, this is a man the king has put a lot of trust in. The man has got a lot of things that he's supposed to do. And when the king heard these words, he was greatly displeased with himself, and he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. I find this amazing. The king says, uh-oh, I said so, but is there a way out of it for Daniel? 
I, I got called in this. He realizes he gets called in this. And so he labors until the sun, uh, down to the sun, until he thinks there's got to be a way out. There's got to be a loophole, right? But there really isn't one. And so they charge Daniel with violating this new law. And so they bring Daniel and they cast him into the lion's den. And again, this is not a man who goes in in fear. This is a man who goes in fearless because of his relationship with God. And then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet ring of his lords. They all said, we have sealed Daniel in here. Goodbye, Daniel. And they probably thought that Daniel was done. That Daniel was done. Stephen has been leading us in a story about a man a God man who was sealed with a stone, but it wasn't done, right? Amen, church? The story was not done. We have preached resurrection here. And so Daniel finds himself in the lion's den. And a place that most people would have been fearful, a place that most people would have known it was their last day on earth. Remember, Daniel's told people about their last day before. Was this his? No, it was not his. Guys, the lion's den in its area still exists today in archaeology. We can still take you to places where, where these were common. People kept exotic animals. And I don't know if you know a lot about lions, but guys, there are a lot of things about lions I didn't know. You know, some of you have little kids in the house and they go through that time where they're really into animals, right? They can tell you all about animals and that kind of thing. Lions are somewhere between four and a half to six and a half feet long from head to the tail. And the tails sometimes are 26 inches long. And they weigh somewhere between 265 and 420. You want a lion sitting on you? Anybody want to come down and let me sit on you and see how that works, right? Right? I mean, you know, I mean, I mean they, these are big animals. And I don't know whether it was an African lion or whether it was an Asian lion because they're right there. Because they also have some, some different characteristics. But, but they can weigh as much as 1,000 pounds. This is an animal, when it jumps on you, you're gone. This is an animal when it's on you, it, it, it's trying to bite your neck or break your neck. And that's what the king was trying to do in a sense to Daniel or they were trying to do to Daniel, but he would not be broken. And so the king shows up the next day and because God sent his angel, because God sent his angel to protect Daniel, Daniel was in that den all night unharmed. And we ought to say hallelujah, right? Right? Because that's what we need, a God who protects us in the lion's den. A God who protects us in the lion's den. And Daniel comes out, and the king is excited that Daniel lived. And the king knows that the other guy set Daniel up, and he puts them in the den instead. Now that's a story we all know. That's a story we all know. And we could spend more time on that part of it, but I want to make sure that you know that there's a practical lesson here for us. It's found in 1 Peter 3, 15 through 17, and it says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, and when the defame you of, as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, it is the will of, God, will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. You ready to go out and do some good in a world that needs to see fearlessness, not fear? I want you to think about that. I want you to think about being weighed in the balances as we let our kids join us back at this moment. Will somebody open the door for me, Steve? We sing for a moment. The steadfast love.
is so good. God is so good. And God wants to be good with you. This morning... something that, that might be new wording for some of us, but not really a new thought. Because we now come to be weighed balances. We come before this table at a time of service to think about who we are. There will be no handwriting on the wall, but if there were, what would it say about you this morning? If all of us could see fingers right now around this room, writing a message to us that only we could see about who we are, what would it say? What would it say? I think of what Jesus has to say to some people in Matthew 23. Are you with me? In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus has to talk to some people who were using their vessels in an inappropriate way. Using their vessels in an inappropriate way. Just like Belshazzar was in that feast. In Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe and the mint and the anise and the cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of life. He says, You have been so trying to follow the little itty bitty things, the big things, you have just walked right by. And you don't even realize those are the ones you are guilty of. We ever looked at someone else's life and and, and said, oh, look at what they are doing, yet forgetting to look in a mirror and adjusting our own life accordingly. <coughs> These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. But this is the one that hit me this week as I talked about this lesson, as I thought about this lesson. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup <coughs> and dish but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. In a few moments, we are going to be partaking of these emblems. These emblems are to remind us, and I don't want to take away from anything that's been prepared by those doing communion with us today, but these emblems have been prepared in probably a sterile environment, a clean environment, for us to take up today. The question we ask ourselves as we gather here as vessels of service, as vessels of worship, are you clean? Are you clean? Are you ready for these things to be a part of your life? Because not that you look clean on the outside, but you are clean on the inside. You see, we can say all we want about Belshazzar and feast and how he inappropriately used the vessels of God. But Jesus calls us on a night and a day like today to say, how are you using what I gave you? How are you using the life that I gave you? How are you using the grace that I give you? How are you using Forgiveness that I give you. That's what we're called on today before we go feast. Before we go feast. And there are two feasts today. One is this one, the Feast of Remembrance. And then there's going to be a Feast of Fellowship. But before we go to that one, I want to make sure you're ready for this one. And a lot of time and a lot of preparation went into that one. A lot of you were up early this morning making your food and packing your cars. And you had to bring a lot of extra stuff. It's a busy day here. But I want to slow it down for just a moment. And I want to make sure you're ready for this one. What did you bring in today that doesn't need to be here? What in your heart needs to be let go of? What in your life needs to be loose? What in your vessel needs to be cleansed? Because you see, it's not handwriting on the wall, but a feast every week we gather to do to remind ourselves of who we need to be. Because we too are weighed in the balances. 
How about it this morning? How's your vessel? Is it ready for service? How is your vessel? Is it ready for the sacred? How is your vessel? Is it ready to go outside today and face a world of fearless? That's what we ask this morning. We're going to sing a song and encourage you to respond to those questions as we sing and as we sing. As the day. 